So Kant famously gives these four examples of each of an action which, as he takes it, fails his test, right? An action which is such that when you attempt to will that the maxim become a universal law, your will ends up contradicting it. Now you might, you know, you might expect that what would be going on here was simply that Kant was giving you, you know, four nice examples and these four nice examples are such that when you read them you just end up with a clearer picture of how the test is supposed to work. Uh, fortunately or not, that's how, not how most people think it turns out. Right? I mean, most contemporary philosophers anyway. Right? Um, it turns out, most of us think, that at least some of these examples are pretty problematic. That they involve Kant sort of not applying his own test particularly well. Some people also suggest a, a sort of explanation of that. The explanation would be that Kant has certain uh, pretty stern and rigid moral views that he inherits from his pietist upbringing and he's sort of committed to making those views come out of his test but they don't in some cases very clearly do so. Right. All right, um, what we're going to do is we'll just work systematically through the examples and the way to do so is to ask with respect to each of them three questions, right? Um, and um, I think I've got the relevant questions or the relevant issues or something on, on a PowerPoint, so let's switch over to that. So what you want to do in evaluating these examples, right? First thing you want to do is identify the maxim. You want to answer the question, you know, what's the maxim here supposed to be? Then second, what you want to do is try to understand Kant's argument for thinking that action on this maxim fails the universal law test. You've got to answer the question, you know, what is Kant's argument that action on this maxim fails the test? Then, third and finally, you want to sort of critically assess the argument. You're not asking, you know, is Kant's argument that action on this maxim fails his test any good? Does it work? So those are the, um, the three stages, the three steps we want to go through in each case. Um, and basically our procedure here is going to be this. We'll take the examples in turn. I'm going to take them in the order that Kant presents them in. I'm going to take them in as I take it, order or sort of descending order of plausibility. So I'll start with the arguments I think are the best and work down to the arguments I think are the least good. Right? And what I'll do is I'll read you what Kant says, right? And then I'll have you try to answer the first two questions, right? What's the maxim? What's Kant's argument that the max action on the maxim fails the test? Right? And there's a sort of, um, there's a fallback version of the second question, right? 
fallback version of the second question, if you can't answer the question, what's the argument that action on the maximum fails this test, try answering at least the question, where is the argument, right? Try pointing to the specific bit of the Kantian passage where that argument is to be found. All right, so we can start this um, with... Uh, What will be the easiest example to do, I think, which is, for one reason we've done it already, and for another reason I think it's the one with the best argument, but, you know, it'll get us warmed up, right? So, we'll start with example number two. I'll, again, I'll read it to you, and then I'm going to be wanting you to address the first two of these questions, namely, you know, what's the maxim, and what's Kant's argument that action on the maxim fails the test. So, again, reading from... Uh, Final paragraph on 63, going over to 64, Kant says. Another man finds himself forced by need to borrow money. He well knows that he will not be able to repay it, but he also sees that nothing will be loaned him if he does not firmly promise to repay it at a certain time. He desires to make such a promise, but he has enough conscience to ask himself whether it is not improper and opposed to duty to relieve his distress in such a way. Now, assuming he does decide to do so, the maximum of his action would be as follows. When I believe myself to be in need of money, I will borrow money and promise to repay it, although I know I shall never do so. Now, this principle of self-love, or of his own benefit, may very well be compatible with his whole future welfare. The question is whether it is right. He changes the pretension of self-love into a universal law and then puts the question, how would it be if my maxim became a universal law? He immediately sees that it could never hold as a universal law of nature and be consistent with itself. Rather, it must necessarily contradict itself. For the universality of a law which says that anyone who believes himself to be in need could promise what he pleased, with the intention of not fulfilling it, would make the promise itself and the end to be accomplished by it impossible. No one would believe what was promised to him, but would only laugh at any such assertion as vain pretense. All right. So let's... let's go through our questions then. So, um, first question to ask about any of these examples, what's the maximum? So what's the maximum on this? Go ahead, yes. That, uh, that anybody who uh, f found themselves in need to, um, to borrow something could merely, uh, uh, without, without the intention of uh, returning what was borrowed, uh, simply promise to promise to return without doing so. Yeah, that's right. I, 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 you're quite right. And there's a sort of explicit um, sentence in this example. There isn't always, but you know, there sometimes is where Kant sort of says, our maxim is colon. You're quite, you're quite right about the, the basic form of the maxim. I mean, the one thing that you've done in articulating it is you've sort of already universalized it, right? Um, whereas when Kant initially articulates, as you see, um, he does the initial version in the sort of non-universalized form. The, so it's when I believe myself to be in the end of money, I will borrow money, etc. Right, and then sort of a bit later on, it universalizes. But I mean, you're quite right about its content. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, second question then: What, or again, you know, fallback? Where is Kant's argument that action on this maxim fails the test? Why does he think that when you try to will that this maxim becomes a universal law, your will contradicts itself? You end up willing something impossible. Someone else want to try that one? What's the argument? Or again, you know, you don't, if, you, if you're not entirely confident saying what's the argument, what the argument is, tell me where it is. Go ahead. I mean, the, the argument is that he's making is that if everyone did this, mm -hmm. then no one would lend any money. So the the entire goal of the thing is to borrow money, but no mm -hmm. one would ever lend because no one would trust anyone. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So so the argument seems to be that, um, it's it, you know, when you try willing this as universal law, you're going to will something impossible because the situation where everyone acts on this maxim is really an impossible situation. It's impossible that everyone borrow money on false promises like this. If everyone tried to do that, then no one would lend money. People would know that they wouldn't get the money back and they wouldn't be prepared to make the loan. Yes. Go 
Good. Um, so, I mean, I start with that example because I think, I mean, I think it's the cleanest. I think it's the best one, right? Um, it, it is possible to try criticizing it. I'll provide you with an objection or criticism, but I think Kant's on pretty strong ground here, right? Um, if you were to try an objection here, here's something you might try. You might say, look, um, perhaps Kant's wrong that it's, um, it's impossible that everyone in need succeed in acting on this maxim. Because look, it might be that um, the number of people in need who, can't, who can't repay money is sufficiently small and the number of people in need who can repay the money is sufficiently large that even if everyone is in need and can't repay the money makes these lying promises, it will still be possible to borrow money because there are going to be such a large number of people who um, will repay the money that you know, the credibility of borrowing money on promises like this will not be undermined. So there's an objection. I don't think it's a strong objection though because I, mean, I think Kant is on you know, very sort of empirically plausible ground, right? As a factual matter, it seems very likely that the number of people in need who can't repay the money is going to be sufficiently great, right? That if all of them uh, attempt to make these lying promises, there will be sufficiently many lying promises that the institution of borrowing money on promises of this kind will be undermined, right? So, yeah. though there is room for a possible objection here, I don't on balance think the objection succeeds. Okay, everyone comfortable with this example? Yeah? All right, so turn now then to a, s a second of the examples, actually the fourth one, right? As I say, I'm not t taking these in Kant's order. Um, I'm taking them in order as I see it of descending plausibility. I should say that we'll come to this when we've gone through each of them. Um, Kant is a systematic philosopher par excellence, right? I mean, you know, so for Kant, it's never, you know, that I've sort of given you three examples, but I might have given you four or five. There's always a reason why they have to be four, and they always have to fall into a definite category, and there's going to be one of each. And I'll, I'll, go, I'll go through how that works once we've talked about each of them, right? But um, we'll, we'll assess them individually first. Okay. So, um, so turn now to the fourth example he gives. So this is starting, the paragraph starts on the bottom of 64, goes over to 65. Same procedure, right? I'll read you the example, then um, I want you to answer the first two questions. What's the maxim? What, or failing that, where is Kant's argument that action on this maxim fails its test? So Kant writes, A fourth man, for whom things are going well, sees that others, whom he could help, have to struggle with great hardships. And he asks, What concern of mine is it? Let each one be as happy as heaven wills, or as he can make himself. I will not take anything from him, or even envy him, but to his welfare or to his assistance in time of need I have no desire to contribute. If such a way of thinking were a universal law of nature, certainly the human race could exist, and without doubt even better than in a state where everyone talks of sympathy and goodwill, or even exerts himself occasionally to practice them, while on the other hand he cheats when he can and betrays or otherwise violates the rights of man. Now, although it is possible that a universal law of nature according to that maxim could exist, it is nevertheless impossible to will that such a principle should hold everywhere as a law of nature. For a will which resolved this would conflict with itself, since instances can often arise in which he would need the love and sympathy of others, and in which he would have robbed himself, by such a law of nature springing from his own will, of all hope of the aid he desires. Okay, so... Um, First question then, with respect to this example, what's the maxim? What, you know, what principle is the person in this ex example acting on? It says let everybody be, don't uh, hinder or help anybody, just let everybody yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, you know, don't get in their way, but don't, don't help them, right? So, um, I mean, one way to put it, I sometimes put it roughly like this, I mean, sort of, you know, the maxim is something like, you know, when I'm well off, I won't help those in need. Yeah. Good. Okay. Second question then. Um, what 
or again failing that where is Kant's argument that action on this maxim fails the test why does he think that you can't um, will that this maxim be a universal law without your will contradicting itself Go ahead. Uh, Kant uh, finds the contradiction in the sense that uh, if if the man who did not will that anyone would did not will that anyone help uh, anybody else, there would be a time when, when he feels himself in need that he would be unable to receive the aid that others would normally give him. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So look. Um, As Kant tells you, actually, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this, it's, you know, it's important to the classification scheme, but as he tells you, the contradiction here works in a slightly different way. I mean, it's not that he thinks that it's impossible that everyone act on this maxim, the maxim of, you know, when I'm well off, I won't help people in need. But he still thinks it's impossible to will that. And, and he, he, here's the argument, and I think you put it, put it nicely, right? The argument is, look, I mean, if I will... Take the maximum, you know, when I'm well off, I won't help anyone in need. Universalize that and w try willing it, okay? Then you will that, you know, no one who's well off help anyone in need, right? But that means that what you're willing is that, you know, if you're in need, no one helps you. But Kant thinks you necessarily will that if you're in need, you be helped, right? So what you will by willing that this maxim become a universal law contradicts what you will for your own case if you become in need. Does that make sense? I think this argument's a decent argument. Um, it's more open to objection than the previous one was. Um, there are a couple of possible objections. I think, I mean, to each of which there's a decent Kantian response, but there are possible objections. Right? Um, so one objection says, well, look, you know, there are people who perhaps they, you know, very self-sufficient, they may never be in need. Right? So there's no contradiction there. A Kantian response would say, might say, it doesn't matter whether a person is ever actually in need. You get a contradiction in their will if there's a contradiction between what they will as a universal law and what they will for the hypothetical situation in which they become in need, whether or not that hypothetical situation is ever realized, is ever actualized. So, you know, on that Kantian response, you know, it wouldn't be enough to say, I'll never in fact be in need, right? You, the Kantian response would say there's still a contradiction in your will if what you will in willing this maxim as a universal law contradicts what you will for the hypothetical situation in which you become in need. Then consider a second objection. The second objection says, but look, there are some people who are committed to this sort of, we might call it kind of libertarian philosophy or something that the person in Kant's example seems to be articulating, right? They're committed to the idea that no one should help anyone in need, and so even should such a person become in need, they will not will that they be helped. Right? So again, the objector says there's no contradiction. Again, I think there's a decent Kantian response to the objection, so the response would be or might be, look, um, as it were, whatever a person's philosophical convictions, um, if they become in need, they won't be able to help themselves. They won't be able to stop themselves from willing that they be helped. Right? So, um, I think on balance, Kant's had is a decent argument here. Right? Um, more open to objection than the argument in the lying promise case. But I think Kant has um, 
you know, decent responses to the obvious possible objections or criticisms. Okay, turn now then to the examples where, as I take it, the Kantian arguments are um, considerably dodgier. No, I'm not even really sure quite what order to take one and three in. I think the argument's pretty dodgy in both cases, um, and I'm not sure that I have a settled view as to which is dodgier. Really. Um, so we might as well just take them in the order Kant takes them in, so start with one. This is the um, suicide example. So same procedure. Yeah? So the procedure is I'm going to read you what he says, and then I'm going to ask you, the first two questions you want to ask about all these examples, namely A, well first, what's the maxim? Second, what's Kant's argument that action on the maxim fails the test? Yeah. So following number one, final full paragraph on 63, Kant describes the example as follows. A man who is reduced to despair by a series of evils feels a weariness with life, but is still in possession of his reason sufficiently to ask whether it would not be contrary to his duty to himself to take his own life. Now he asked whether the maxim of his action could become a universal law of nature. His maxim, however, is, for love of myself, I make it my principle to shorten my life, when by a longer duration it threatens more evil than satisfaction. But it is questionable whether this principle of self-love could become a universal law of nature. One immediately sees a contradiction in a system of nature, whose law would be to destroy life, by the feeling whose special office is to impel the improvement of life. In this case it would not exist as nature, Hence that maxim cannot obtain as a law of nature, and thus it wholly contradicts the supreme principle of all duty. Alright, so um, first, easier question about this example then. So what's the maxim here? Go ahead. Uh, he says, for love of myself, I make it my principle to shorten my life when, when by a longer duration it threatens more evil than satisfaction. Quite right, yeah. So this is one of those cases where Kant has one of those explicit, here is the maxim, colon sentences, and you um, picked it out exactly, right? You might try abbreviating it a bit, right? You might say, you know, the general idea is, you know, uh, when my future look, looks on balance bad, I will commit suicide out of self-love or something, right? But, I mean, that's, that's the idea. All right, second question then. What, or again, as a fallback, where is Kant's argument that action on this maxim fails the test? Yeah. Um, I would say that he says. He says that if you kill yourself, then you give yourself no chance to improve your life by ending your future already, maybe. Yeah, you might think that. I mean, it's tricky. It's, re uh, it's really tricky to um, understand even what the argument is supposed to be here, right? Um, I mean, the key sentence seems to be the second to last sentence of the paragraph, right? Um, where Kant says, one immediately sees a contradiction in the system of nature whose law would be to destroy life by the feeling whose special office is to impel the improvement of life. So I suggest the argument is best understood, the you know, putative argument is best understood this way. The argument is um, the purpose of self-love is to impel the improvement of life. So if one were to attempt to commit suicide out of self-love, what one would be doing would be um, contradicting the purpose of self-love, and hence there's, there's a contradiction. It's, a bit, it's tempting, I should say, to read the argument another way, to read the argument as, you know, um, if everyone did this, there wouldn't be any people around, right? I don't, on balance, think that's what's going on. Because, for one thing, I don't think that sort of gets the stuff about the purpose of self-love enough of a role, and it does seem to be important in what Kant says. 
but I can sort of see why people sometimes read it that way. And it's, I know it's tricky. Right? I think it's a very good. I don't think it's a very good argument. Why not? This is the third question. Well, look, I mean, if the argument is as I have depicted it, then it seems to me there are sort of three problems, right? Um, first problem. Uh, It's not clear um, why we should accept that suicide contradicts the purpose of self-love. I mean, why think that the purpose of self-love is what Kant says it is? Why not think the purpose of self-love is, you know, to impel the improvement of life when life can be improved and to, you know, end a bad life when life can't be improved? I mean, his argument only works if he's got this particular story about the purpose of self-love, and it's not clear how he can justify that story. Second, suppose he's right about the purpose of self-love. It's not clear that a contradiction between what you propose to do and the purpose of self-love is a contradiction in your will. I mean, after all, you know, why should self-love's purpose be your purpose? Right? I mean, if your purpose is to end your life when, you know, the continued duration threatens more, uh, you know, pain than satisfaction or whatever, you know, as it were, so that conflicts with the purpose of self-love, so what? You know, why, why should you accept, why should you internalize to your will self-love's purpose? Third criticism. Um, this is an odd example in this way. The argument doesn't seem to involve universalizing at all, right? You seem to be able to get the putative contradiction just by focusing on the individual maxim for your own case. Right? And that's sort of weird as an example of the universal law test. Right? I mean, you think that, that uh, you know, an example of the universal law test ought to depend in some crucial way, as, as the example did in the other two cases right, that we looked at so far. It, the the contra supposed contradiction ought to be generated in some important way by universalizing. But that doesn't seem to be the case here, right? I mean, it seems like you can get the contradiction if the argument is what we just attributed to Kant without universalizing at all. So I don't think the argument there is particularly good at all myself. It's a poor argument. Everyone cool with that one? No? All right, so turn finally then to the third example. Again, as you'll expect at this stage, I, I, I don't in the end think that the argument here is very good. Again, though, same procedure, right? I'm going to read you the example, then I'll ask you the first two questions. What's the maxim? What, or failing that, where is Kant's argument that action on the maxim fails its test? Right? So then, paragraph starting about the middle of 64, following the number three, he says... A third finds in, in himself a talent which could, by means of some cultivation, make him in many respects a useful man. But he finds himself in comfortable circumstances and prefers indulgence in pleasure to troubling himself with broadening and improving his fortunate natural gifts. Now, however, let him ask whether his maxim of neglecting his gifts, besides agreeing with his propensity to idle amusement, agrees also with what is called duty. He sees that a system of nature could indeed exist in accordance with such a law, even though man, like the inhabitants of the South Sea Islands, should let his talents rust and resolve to devote his life merely to idleness, indulgence and propagation, in a word to pleasure. But he cannot possibly will that this should become a universal law of nature, or that it should be implanted in us by a natural instinct. For as a rational being he necessarily wills that all his faculties should be developed, inasmuch as they are given to him for all sorts of possible purposes. 
Okay, same two questions then. Um, first question about that example. So what's the maximum there? Uh, if I have some kind of skill or talent, I should develop it uh, only as far as I only as far as I desire to bring myself pleasure. Yeah, something. Like, I mean, I think you know the idea is, I, as you might put it, something like this. You know, when I'm comfortable, I won't develop my talents. Right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so next question then: What, or again, failing that? Where is Kant's argument that action on this maxim fails the test? Very last sentence. Yeah, I think you're right. Rational, yeah, being can't really put into words. But. Yeah, I, I, I think that's good. I mean, that's uh, you, you're quite right. I think that the last sentence is where, is where it's at for the argument, such as it is. Right? Um, there, Kant says, for as a rational being, he necessarily wills that all his faculties should be developed, inasmuch as they're given to him for all sorts of possible purposes. Right? So again, you know, this is like w with. Uh, um, the charity helping others in need case, right? I mean, Kant thinks it's possible that everyone act on um, the maxim you propose to act on here, this maxim, you know, when I'm comfortable, I won't develop my talents. Right? But he thinks it's impossible to will it, right? Because, I mean, it, you know, it's possible for everyone to act on it. That's the South Sea Islanders, according to, you know, Kant's anthropology. That's um, how they behave, right? But he thinks it's impossible to will it. Why is it impossible to will it? Well, he says, because if you willed it, you'd contradict something else that as a rational being you necessarily will, namely that your talents be developed. Not as developed there, I think, at all a persuasive argument, right? Two obvious problems, right? A, it all depends on this, I mean Kant's argument that there's a contradiction here depends on this premise that he seems to kind of pull out of the air here without any real justification, the premise that as a rational being you necessarily will that your talents be developed. You know, he doesn't give any adequate justification for that and that's, you know, that's absolutely crucial to generating the contradiction. Second, as with the suicide example, it's an odd example of a universal law test because it does the contradiction, get, generating the contradiction doesn't seem to depend on universalizing, right? Because again, I mean, there seems to be a immediate contradiction between what you will for your own case and what as a rational being according to Kant you necessarily will, right? And you don't seem to need to universalize to get that contradiction. So again, very odd example of a universal law test in action because you know you get the result without seeming to need to universalize. Okay, everyone comfortable with that? Okay, so as I told you then, um, Kant's a systematic philosopher, right? So it's not just some random collection of four examples. As he sees it, there are four examples because they, um, they're one each of um, four possible categories, okay? Um, Kant explains that in how that's all supposed to work in the paragraph that follows um, the description of the examples. Let me read you what he says and then I'll try and explain what's going on. Um, so he says, the foregoing are, are a few of the many actual duties, or at least of duties we hold to be actual, whose derivation from the one stated principle is clear. We must be able to will that a maxim of our action become a universal law. This is the canon of the moral estimation of our action generally. Some actions are of such a nature that their maxim cannot even be thought as a universal law of nature without contradiction, far from it being possible that one could will that it should be such. In other words, this internal impossibility is not found, though it is still impossible to will that their maxim should be raised to the universality of a law of nature, because such a will would contradict itself. We easily see that the former maxim conflicts with the stricter or narrower imprescriptible duty, 
the latter with the broader meritorious duty. Thus, all duties, so far as the kind of obligation, not the object of their action is concerned, have been completely exhibited by these examples in their dependence on the one principle. Okay, in a way that you can sort of partly get out of that paragraph, um, you've got four examples because um, you've got four categories, right, generated by two distinctions, right? One distinction is the distinction between duties to self and duties to others, right? That's a pretty straightforward distinction, right? Um, Duties to self, duties just involving you, duties to others, duties involving other people. Right? So the suicide example, developing talents example, those are supposed to involve duties to self. The lying promise example, the helping others charity example, is supposed to involve duties to others. Right? So that's one distinction. The other distinction is the one he explicitly talks about in the paragraph I just read, the distinction between um, stricter and broader duty. Right. This too isn't a distinction that Kant thinks he invents. I mean, other moral philosophers before him use it, but it probably needs a little bit more articulation. So the idea roughly is this. Um, stricter duties, those are th duties such that you absolutely have to do them on every occasion that they come up. You don't get any choice or discretion about how, when, and why to do them. Right? So for instance, the duty not to kill other people would be a strict duty. By contrast, the idea is broader duties are duties that you have some obligation to do, but you don't have to do them on every occasion. You get a little discretion you, you know, as to how, when, and why you do them. Right. So as Kant would see it, you know, as you've seen from one of his examples, right? one example of a broader duty would be a duty to help others in need. And Kant's idea would be you don't have to help everyone in need that you could possibly help. You have to help some people in need sometimes and you get a lot of discretion as to how and when and so forth to do that. Okay. So you've got these two distinctions then, right? You've got the distinction between uh, duties to self, duties to others, and the distinction between uh, stricter and broader duty. And that generates the four examples, right? So the suicide example, that strict duty to self, lying promise example, strict duty to others, developing talents example, broad duty to self, um, helping others in need, broad duty to others. Right? So that's why you get four. Yeah. The other thing Kant tells you in that paragraph is sort of how the, um, as he takes it, the distinction between stricter and broader duties um, plays out in terms of his test. So what he says in that paragraph is it's like this. When you contemplate violations of stricter duties, what happens is that you can't even imagine everyone acting on the principle that you propose to act on. That's how it's supposed to be in the lying promise case and the suicide case. By contrast, in the case of broader duties, the idea is, yes, you can coherently imagine it's possible for everyone to act on the maxim you propose to act on. But it's still not possible to will it, because it contradicts something else that you will. Right? See how that's supposed to work? Right. So the idea is, you know, with a, you know, take the better examples. With a lying promise example, you generate a contradiction immediately because you can't even universalize the maxim coherently. Right? It's, it's not even possible that there'd be a situation where everyone, um, you know, make these lying promises. Right? By contrast, in the charity case, the thought is, yes, it's possible that everyone, you know, act on this maxim of not, you know, when well off, not helping those in need. But it's still impossible to will it, and it's impossible to will it because um, if you will that maxim, it contradicts something else that you will, right? Namely, that if in need, you be helped. So, um, as you can see from that, in when Kant sort of explaining why there are the different examples there are, how they work, the, um, the distinction he focuses on, and as I just said, sort of tells you a story about in terms of his test, is the stricter duty, broader duty distinction. Right? I mean, I'm a bit inclined actually, 
to draw attention to the other distinction, the duty to self, duties to others distinction, in that, as you've seen as we go through, I think systematically the examples he gives of duties to others are examples where he gives much more plausible arguments than he does in the case of duties to self, right? So the two examples of duties to others, the lying promise example and the <coughs> charity example, I think he's got a much better case than he does either in the for the suicide example or the developing talents example. All right. Um, so does anyone at this stage want to ask anything else about these examples? Going one. Why? Go on. Okay. Well, I mean, that's a good point to start for today. We've done a lot of stuff. <laughs>